So Julian Assange has been indicted under the Espionage Act of 1917. And in my research, I ended up going down a rabbit hole. And that rabbit hole kind of took me into a place that was quite uncomfortable. I, I uncovered some pretty uncomfortable, um, which it wasn't like I really uncovered it. That's not really the right word. I, it just, in my research, the more that I looked, it's all in plain sight, but the stuff that I found was very alarming. And I'm actually gonna walk you through my journey. So you're gonna go into the rabbit hole with me. <laughs> uh, let's first start off with Julian Assange and just kind of go over um, a little bit of why now the mainstream media is actually going to to bat for him, which wasn't happening for a while there, you know, that the mainstream media was remaining pretty mum. And now all of a sudden they're saying, hey, wait a minute, this is actually an attack on free speech, on free press, and this isn't a good thing and everybody should be outraged, which I found really comforting to see. It was like, okay, hey, finally they're stepping up and saying something. Um, for example, this article, I think this really explains why the the indictments of Julian Assange under the Espionage Act, why it's actually an attack on the free press. So I'm going to read quite a bit of this article to you, and then we're going to go further into the rabbit hole. OK, so stick with me. This is going to be a long video, but I hope that you get a lot out of it when it's all said and done, uh, because I, I again, this is one of those videos where I did a lot of research on and wrestling with. And uh, anyway, join me, will you? Here we go. So this article was, was written by Elizabeth Goitin. It says, the U.S. says Julian Assange is no journalist. Here's why that shouldn't matter. WikiLeaks founder Julian Assange on Thursday became the first person to face prosecution in the United States for publishing classified information, although newspapers routinely publish government secrets that have been leaked to them. Defending the unprecedented move, Assistant Attorney General John Demers said Julian Assange is no journalist. That's what they're saying. Millions of Americans no doubt agree. Yet in making this distinction, the Justice Department is drawing a line the First Amendment simply doesn't draw and is threatening the freedom of every news outlet in the process. So... Uh, what she's talking about there with the Supreme Court, for example, in two different Supreme Court rulings, the press has been described as essentially any information one chooses to print or speak. So in the 1972 case of Bra uh, Brazenberg versus Hayes, it was described as a fundamental personal right not confined to newspapers and periodicals. In Lovell versus City of Griffin in 1938, Ch Chief Justice Charles Evans Hughes defined the press as every sort of publication which affords a vehicle of information and opinion. So this right has been extended to newspapers, books, plays, movies, and video games. And obviously, this would also extend to WikiLeaks because WikiLeaks is giving information to the people. So it would absolutely uh, fall under this definition. Now, she goes on to say in this article, the federal indictment alleges Assange solicited and received classified information from Chelsea Manning and published that information through WikiLeaks. The documents he published included official assessments of detainees at the U.S. military base in Guantanamo Bay, files relating to rules of engagement for U.S. troops in the Iraq war and State Department cables. Some revealed incriminating information about the conduct of American soldiers and other government officials. In a few cases, they included the names of foreign citizens who provided intelligence to the United States. Assange is being charged under the Espionage Act, a law passed during World War I to punish spies and traitors, which we're going to go much deeper into what the Espionage Act is and who has been actually convicted under the act in the history of, of this country. But in recent years, the law increasingly has been used against government employees who leak classified information to the media. The Obama administration brought eight prosecutions for media leaks, more than all previous administrations combined. And the Trump administration has upped the ante, bringing seven prosecutions in the space of two years. Alarmingly, many of the defendants have been whistleblowers. They disclosed information indicating waste, fraud, or abuse on the part of the government. National Security Agency employee Th Thomas Drake, for instance, was charged with disclosing information about an illegal NSA surveillance program to a Baltimore Sun reporter. Nonetheless, until now, the Justice Department distinguished between government employees who leak classified information, deemed prosecutable, and outlets that publish it, considered to have First Amendment protection. The Obama administration flirted with erasing that line. In court documents, it described a Fox News chief Washington correspondent, James Rosen, as an aider, abetter, and or co-conspirator in an Espionage Act case. 
The administration also reportedly considered bringing charges against Assange, but ultimately Obama's Justice Department decided prosecuting publishers of leaked information would be a bridge too far. That was the right decision. Although the Espionage Act does not recognize a line between leaker and publisher, the First Amendment, as interpreted by the courts, does. The Supreme Court has long held that government employees may be required to relinquish some free speech rights as a condition of their employment. Officials with access to classified information sign non-disclosure agreements in which they agree to be subject to criminal penalties for leaking. Pub for leaking. Publishers obviously signed no such waivers. She goes on to say, Assange, however, engaged in the explicit solicitation of classified material and made no effort to redact information that could put people at risk. Deemer said, in the Justice Department's views, uh, Assange is therefore not a journalist and is subject to prosecution for his actions. But she goes on to say, the First Amendment also does not protect illegal conduct, such as trespassing or robbery undertaken for the purpose of obtaining information. Assange allegedly offered to help Manning break into government computer systems, which would violate the Computer Fraud and Abuse Act. The Justice Department, however, already charged Assange under that law several weeks ago. The new Espionage Act charges go much further, seeking to penalize Assange for simply encouraging and inducing Manning's disclosures. News outlets routinely cultivate national security of officials as sources and solicit information from them, knowing full well that much of the information in those officials' possessions is classified. So, look, I mean, she's saying this is normal. This is normal for all journalists, all news, news outlets. They also routinely publish information they acquire through such interactions. Still, and this is an important part of this article, because as we go down the rabbit hole, you'll see why. Still, many Americans instinctively contend that Assange is different. The charges against Assange have nothing to do with the WikiLeaks publication of emails from Democratic National Committee accounts and from Hillary Clinton's private server. But those in incidents color Americans' perceptions of Assange. They say his goal is to harm the United States, that he may be aligned with Russia, and that he cannot be trusted to make responsible decisions about when to publish classified information. Indeed, few would dispute that Assange acted irresponsibly when he published the names of Afghans and Iraqis who cooperated with U.S. forces. But I want us to kind of pause and think a little bit more about that, about that uh, paragraph there, talking about how Assange, in the mind of many Americans, is aligned or has colluded with Russia in some way, which we've heard this for the last two years over and over and over again about a variety of people. So uh, she goes on to say, there is an excellent reason, though, why the First Amendment does not turn on the government's assessment of a publisher's level of responsibility or fealty to the United States, one that becomes self-evident when considering President Trump's comments on the press. So she's saying, you know, we can't rely on the U.S. government's idea of who's a journalist or who's considered uh, a good journalist because look at President Trump. Look at how he is when he calls everybody fake news. He calls every press and news outlet an enemy of the people. So who can you, you, you can't certainly trust, if you can't trust the president's opinion, then who can you trust? That's why the First Amendment just protects everybody. It's not about, well, are you a good journalist or not? It doesn't, it doesn't matter. Robust protection for speech means that people will sometimes make bad calls, revealing potentially harmful information of little public interest. Society can and should condemn those disclosures, but there can be no Assange carve-out to the First Amendment. The Justice Department's attempt to rewrite their core constitutional protection is a threat to every person or entity who publishes information and every American who receives it. And she is absolutely right. This was a great article in the Washington Post. Post Elizabeth Goitine, um, which she's the co-director of the Liberty and National Security Program at the Brennan Center for Justice at the New York uh, at NYU School of Law. I haven't looked into her or, uh, but anyway, that was a great article. So um, after, and I think this really spells out why this is a problem for those who, you know, for the press, for anybody who considers themselves press. Which then I looked up what makes a person press. And that is also when I came across those Supreme Court rulings, which, you know, there is no real definition of what makes a person a journalist or what makes a publication official press. You, anybody could be called a journalist. There's no credentialing. There's no schooling for this. There's no, you don't register with the government to say, okay, I'm a journalist now. Anybody can be a journalist. And that definition is very open for interpretation. So what you want to consider press or journalism is up to you to decide. And there's 
many different types of it. So um, there's really no universe, you know, there, uh, Julian Assange is absolutely press. Now, you might not say he's a journalist because what he does, he's a publisher, He's but that's still part of the press. So my next question was, what does the Espionage Act actually say? What is this thing? So I looked that up and it's a bit uh, long and cumbersome, so I'm not going to bore you with reading you the entire thing. But essentially what it says, there's nine different sections, but most of the sections deal with who they're going to prosecute, you know, like if you are uh, or how they're going to prosecute you or whatever. But the main sections that talk about who they would go after, what you would have to have done in order to be considered at fault under the Espionage Act is, says Section 1, whoever for the purpose of obtaining information respecting the national defense with intent or reason to believe that the information to be obtained is to be used to the injury of the United States or to the advantage of any foreign nation. So that sounds reasonable enough. If you're going to get information and you're going to use it against the United States or you're going to use it against a foreign nation, that is what they would, so they would say that is an act of espionage. Um, they also say whoever for the purpose with the like intent of reason or reason to believe copies, takes or makes or obtains or attempts or induces or aids another to copy, take, make, obtain or sketch or photograph, you know, any sort of note or writing connected with national defense would be considered espionage. Um, this is why somebody like Chelsea Manning would have been and was convicted under the under the Espionage Act, because if you're a person who takes this information and you copy it and then you uh, that could be considered an act of espionage, whoever for the purpose receives, obtains, agrees, attempts or induces or aids another to receive, obtain uh, that is why they're saying Julian Assange is potentially guilty is for inducing or aiding another to receive or obtain this information. They say, um, whoever with the intent or reason to believe that it is, be, is to be used to the injury of the United States or to the advantage of a foreign nation, delivers or transmits or attempts to or aids or induces another or communicates or delivers to or transmits. I mean, this gets really cumbersome. But essentially, you can kind of guess what <laughs> I mean, it should be fairly plain and straightforward, right, of what exactly the Espionage Act would be. If you are somebody who is spying on behalf of a foreign nation to go against the United States, then yes, you should probably be uh, indicted and convicted under the es Espionage Act. Being a journalist and printing information to the public and not for a foreign government is where really I think there should be a bit of upheaval from all of us. We should all be saying, hey, wait, no, 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 no. If they're going to be giving everybody, all the public, this information because it's crime that has been committed or something that has gone awry in our own government, that absolutely should be protected from the Espionage Act, no matter who does it. But... Um, my next question after reading that was, well, so who has been convicted under the Espionage Act? So I kind of read, read through this. I get who they're, you know, they're, what they're saying a bit. I, I'm not a lawyer, so it's, you know, and I did a, a quick read. I was in the rabbit hole. So I wanted to see who had been convicted of the Espionage Act. And this is where things get alarming. Of the 52 people, so 52 people have been convicted. Now, I'm not talking about who have all been indicted. There have been plenty more people indicted under the Espionage Act who are either waiting to be convicted, you know, they're waiting to go to trial, or their case was dismissed. But 52 people have been convicted under the Espionage Act. And when I looked at those 52 and went through each one individually and read all of the cases, nearly half of those 52 were in some way, shape, or form an anti-establishment American. And what I mean by that is, so a little half, a little over half were actual spies. So these were people that were former CIA operatives, for example, who became double agents for like the KGB or people who sold actual intel to foreign governments. So they were indicted and they were charged. Those were actual spies, or at least they were accused of being an actual spy. I mean, but th that's what the crime was for a little bit more than half. But the other half of the people 
were deemed or self-declared anarchists, communists, socialists, anti-war activists, or whistleblowers who exposed the crimes of the military. That was the other half. So the other half were activists or people who just were against the mainstream establishment narrative and whistleblowers who were calling out the crimes of the government. These were people that were basically against a hyper-capitalist society. Uh, they were against a police state. They were against the big war machine. And uh, because of that, apparently they were closely examined and ultimately considered a criminal under the Espionage Act. So for example, uh, let's go over some of these so that you can understand exactly what I'm talking about or who I'm talking about. Um, let me find my document here, my trusty document. Sorry, guys. There's just, uh, here we go. William Albertson. So it goes in alphabetical order here. These are the ones that are, were the activists or anti-establishment Americans who were, some I guess weren't all Americans, but William Albertson was a 20th century American leader in the Communist Party of the USA who battled federal and state courts and who in a 1960, and who in 1964 was framed by the FBI, which was only discovered posthumously in 1975. <laughs> So we're off to a good start here. Okay, you know, this is in alphabetical order. We're off to a good start. So the first one on the list of 52, oh, it turns out, uh, yeah, so yeah, he was a 20th century American leader of the Communist Party, but oh yeah, he was framed by the FBI, and that's why he ended up getting convicted under the Espionage Act. Oh, okay. We got John Ballum. He was an American Marxist political activist and trade union organizer. He is best remembered as a founding member and one of the pioneer leaders of the Communist Party of America and as a leader of the Trade Union Unity League in the textile industry during the 1930s. Ballum was sentenced under the Espionage Act for a speech he delivered against American participation in the First World War. What? What? Okay, so he was convicted under because he gave an anti-war speech. Okay, Earl Russell Browder was an American political activist and leader of the Communist Party of America, who during World War I, Browder served time in federal prison as a conscientious objector to conscription and the war. Again, another anti-war activist convicted under the Espionage Act. Oh, this is great, guys. Ralph Hosea Chaplin was an American writer, artist, and labor activist in 1917. 1917 Chaplin and some other 100 people were rounded up, convicted, and jailed under the Espionage Act for conspiring to hinder the draft and encourage desertion. So another anti-war activist. Eugene Victor. Now, you know, and I'm not saying that all types of anti-war activism is great. I mean, I didn't dig too deep into all of these different cases because that would have then taken me months, if not years. But... Um, so, of course, there could be cases where maybe they went too far, but overall, you're kind of getting the gist of what's going on here, right? Eugene Victor Debs was an American socialist, political activist, trade union, unionist. Debs made a speech in Canton, Ohio, urging resistance to the military draft of World War I. He was arrested and charged with 10 counts of sedition. So, again, uh, speaking out against cons conscription, uh, the draft, and he was arrested for this. Now, look, again, I'm not, I'm not a communist. I'm not for the Communist Party. But to each their own, everybody should have the right to think what they want and think how the politics in our country should be uh, shaped. I mean, everybody, you shouldn't be considered a criminal for that. And that should be alarming to all of us. That should be alarming. Maria Qui was an American medical doctor in the American West devoted to providing care to working class and poor patients. She regularly pro provided birth control information and abortions at a time when both were illegal. She became a political activist and advocated civic and economic reforms, including women's right to vote and an eight hour workday charged under the Espionage Act. Ricardo Flores Magnon was a noted Mexican anarchist and social reform activist. Activist. He has been considered an important participant in the social movement that sparked the Mexican Revolution. Emma Goldman was an anarchist political activist and writer. She played a pivotal role in the development of anarchist political philosophy in North America and Europe in the first half of the 20th century. Convicted under the Espionage Act, William Big Bill Haywood was a founding member and leader of the Industrial Workers of the World and a member of the Executive Committee of the Socialist Party of America. M. L. Herman was a German-American socialist and anti-war activist, a three-time candidate for Congress on the ticket of the Socialist Party of America. Watch out, Al Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez, they're coming for you. I mean, that's what this list is kind of saying, that if you, 
align yourself against the capitalism, if you align yourself against the war, this is what your fate will be. Frederick Kraft was an American social poli- socialist political activist and politician, twice nominated by the Socialist Party of America as its candidate for governor of New Jersey and twice a candidate for the United States Congress. Kraft was speaking on a street corner in Newark, New Jersey. A complaint was filed by soldiers in the crowd who accused him of of attempting to cause insubordination and disloyalty in the armed forces. Carrie Kate Richards O'Hare was an American Socialist Party activist, editor, editor, and orator. For giving an anti-war speech in Bowman, North Dakota, O'Hare was convicted and sent to prison under the Espionage Act. Labrado Riviera was an anarchist during the Mexican Revolution. Molly Steimer was an act- anarchist and activist who fought as a trade unionist, an anti-war activist, and free speech campaigner. David Trong was a South Vietnamese national who lived in the United States and partook in anti-Vietnam war peace movement. I mean, those are the people that they're convicting under the Espionage Act. Now, most of these were older. They're from World War I, but history repeats itself. Remember this. So let's talk about these seven different ones. So that so of the half, uh, like I mentioned, many were activists or they were anti-establishment Americans, so they were against the, you know, the big capitalist and warmongering machines. But seven of them were whistleblowers. And that would be Stephen Jin Woo Kim is a former State Department contractor who disclosed classified information to Fox News. Samuel Leibowitz is an American lawyer and blogger who was convicted of leaking classified FBI information to another blogger. You've got Chelsea Manning, you know, that she gave the information to WikiLeaks. Samuel Loring Morrison, an intelligence professional who gave documents to the press about the Soviets. Um... Jeffrey Alexander Sterling, an American lawyer and former CIA employee who was arrested, charged and convicted of violating the Espionage Act for revealing details about Operation Merlin, which is a covert operation to supply Iran with flawed nuclear warhead blueprints to journalist James Risen. Reality, Reality Lay Winner is a former in, American intelligence specialist who gave The Intercept classified information regarding Russian election interference. John Chris Caraco is a retired intelligence officer who gave ABC News information regarding torture. So just about half were anti-war, anti-establishment, anti-capitalism, and they were convicted under the Espionage Act. Isn't that strange? I mean, shouldn't people who are convicted under the Espionage Act be actual spies or traitors, people who actually went and and sold information to foreign gov- governments who were double agents. I mean, so my next question, going further down the rabbit hole, was how is this different than treason? Well, the definition of treason is very specific. Treason against the United States shall consist only in levying war against them or in adhering to their enemies, giving them aid and comfort. So you have to be waging war against the nation in order to be convicted of treason. And uh, really, uh, okay, so there have been 20 people in the history of the United States who have been convicted of treason. 20 people, that's it. And of the 20, half, 10, 10 were broadcasters, journalists, and news correspondents who were accused of propagandizing for the enemy. So 10 of the 20 were broadcasters, news correspondents, and journalists. 10 of the 20 for treason. I mean, that's like the highest crime in the country. (laughs) And 10 of 20. So... um, Now, all of these people were essentially uh, convicted for propagandizing for the Nazis, essentially. So Robert Henry Best was an American foreign correspondent who covered events in Europe for American media outlets during the interwar period. Later, he became a Nazi supporter and well-known broadcaster of Nazi propaganda during World War II. Uh, Herbert John Bergman was an American broadcaster of Nazi propaganda during World War II. Douglas Chandler was an American broadcaster of Nazi propaganda during World War II. Iva Ikuku Tuguri de Quino. Now, she was uh, ultimately, it was uh, pardoned. I think, is that is that the right term? When it's pardoned, when they completely reverse, they erase it. It was like, uh, I think they completely erased. Uh, it, it said that she was wrongly 
convicted. She was an American who participated in broadcast, English language radio broadcasts transmitted by Radio Tokyo. She was also called Tokyo Rose. Mildred Elizabeth Gillers, who was nicknamed Axis Sally, was also an American broadcaster employed by Nazi Germany to disseminate propaganda during World War II. So those were some of the people that were convicted of treason. Uh, There were a bunch others, uh, but I couldn't get much information on exactly what they did. There was a few, uh, well, a few others that were also broadcasters or news organizations. They were journalists or broadcasters or correspondents of some kind who were also convicted of treason. Um, so, okay, so look, I don't think it's a good thing to propagandize for the Nazis. I'm not saying that. But I think my question would be, at what point are you considered a propagandizer for the enemy. So at what? where would they draw the line there? So if you were someone who the establishment claims cozies up, you know, cozies up with brutal dictators, or if you are unwilling to call someone an enemy, if you then advocate for peace and you don't want the war, if you're, if you're speaking up against the war, if you're saying it's the wrong thing to do, if you're maybe even telling people don't join the military, don't don't engage in this. You know, at what point are you going to be someone who is considered to be propagandizing for the enemy? At what point would they deem that? So the most absurd thing about this list is that there were, during World War II, some major U.S. corporations who actually aided the Nazis in the murdering of people. And they were not even indicted. They weren't even investigated, let alone indicted or convicted. Actual companies, U.S. companies, like, for example, I mean, (laughs) remember the list I just told you. These were people that were propagandizing for the Nazis, and maybe they actually were. But is that worse than? The Rockefellers, their foundation funded eugenics research and experiments carried out by the Nazis. They funded eugenics experiments carried out by the Third Reich. Ford and GM manufactured engines for Nazi planes and manufactured other parts that were used by the Nazi military. IBM provided the machines and the technology, as well as regular maintenance of those machines and support of those machines that helped the Germans kill millions of Jews. They were directly responsible for the machines and the technology that basically hunted down all of the Jews, put them, rounded them up, put them in the, in the concentration camps and they were subsequently murdered. IBM helped supply them with this technology. But where were the convictions? Where were the convictions? Where were the investigations? Where were the indictments? But no, they were going to go after the people on the radio who were saying things like, oh, the Nazis aren't so bad, which, you know, look, I'm not apologizing for, but I'm, if I'm going to weigh things out as far as what I would consider treason, I'm not going to really say, I don't know if I would call that treason when there were people, Americans, who were manufacturing weapons for the Nazis. So here we are. History repeats itself. You know, we're starting to see the seeds be sown. If you notice a common thread amongst those who have been convicted under the Espionage Act, uh, most of them had to do with the Soviets. And here we are, the last two years, it's been the fear that people are somehow colluding with Russians. And my big fear with that is that the Democrats who have been harping on Trump and the Republicans and saying, oh, you guys are colluding with Russians and this constant kind of witch hunt on who's colluding with Russians and who's doing this, I think this could result in a serious backlash. And I know that Tulsi Gabbard has talked about this. She's often said that this push about this Russiagate narrative against the Republicans, against the Trump administration, could result in the in this new Cold War, that it's escalating the tensions, because now what you've got is Trump wanting to prove that 
that he's not colluding with Russians. And that would create this uh, hostility and the arms race between the United States and Russia, once again, creating another Cold War. But I think there could be another consequence to that. And it's another round of this hunting, this witch hunt. All of these people who've been convicted under the Espionage Act somehow were communists or socialists or connected with Russia in some way. And that is where I think, that's really where I think things would head. Before I see us going into a full-blown Cold War with Russia again, I think that could happen if a Democrat gets into office, if certain Democrats get in. I do think that we would end up in a, in a new Cold War for sure. But with Trump in office, the one thing that after reading through all of these documents, after seeing who had been convicted under the Espionage Act, all of a sudden it was it was frightening to me because I then realized that Really, what's more likely is that Trump and his administration, Republicans, are going to try to prove that they're not colluding with Russians by showing that instead it's people on the left. People on the left are the real colluders. You know, it's like when you accuse somebody of doing something, maybe it's you who's really doing it. And that's where I think they would head. I think that they would look. We're starting to see this with Julian Assange. Here is somebody who published documents that essentially were saying, look at what the military has been up to. No good. And now he's being hunted down. We're seeing this. We're seeing the demonization coming from both sides, the right and the left, of act anti-war candidates of Tulsi Gabbard, for example, of even Bernie Sanders for being a socialist, of Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez for being a part of the Democratic Socialists of America. We're starting to see the attacks of those who are anti-war or those who are somehow aligned or seemingly aligned with our enemies. They call you a, a, a Putin apologist or they'll say that you're cozying up to brutal dictators if you want to say, hey, look, maybe we shouldn't go to war with these people. That's what they do. They write articles. They spread misinformation. They spread news. They, spread, they, they demonize. And they try to turn people against you. And that is what has happened in that article, the Washington Post article that I read to you about Julian Assange. That, that, that paragraph that was very important saying that the perception in Americans' minds about Julian Assange is that he is somehow colluding with Russians. And that's why so many people are turning a blind eye to this obvious, this indictment that absolutely is an attack on the free press. And it's obvious that it is. But so many Americans don't see it because they're too blinded by this idea that he's colluding with Russians, that he's somehow against America. And that mindset, that narrative is going to seep in to many other areas. That's not going to be just Assange. He's just the beginning. History repeats itself. And now what we're going to see is the Trump administration and the GOP going after those of us on the left who speak up against war, who speak up and, and say, I'm not willing to call someone my enemy if they're not aiming nukes at us. So for me, this was particularly frightening going down this rabbit hole because uh, obviously, as somebody who talks often about, uh, I, you know, obviously I'm very anti-regime change. I'm very anti-war unless absolutely necessary, unless we are under attack. I'm anti-war. I'm anti the regime change. I'm anti the establishment narratives. And seeing those who've been convicted of treason, the 10 news broadcasters, radio broadcasters, journalists, the 10 that have been convicted out of 20 for treason, the the numerous people under the Espionage Act, the activists, the, the people who were anti-war, who were then convicted on the Espionage Act, this was absolutely frightening for me to see. So you could see how I went down this rabbit hole and I had a hard time coming back up. I'm not sure if I am out of it yet. But it's all very frightening to me. And it should be frightening to every last one of us. This should be frightening to others who are also anti-war, to Tulsi Gabbard, to Jimmy Dore, to anyone who speaks up against the establishment, to anyone, Abby Martin, anybody who is against the establishment, against war, this should be a this should be alarming for absolutely everybody. You know, Trump keeps talking about socialists, keeps demonizing socialists. That could be the next thing. You know, for the longest time, it's been build the wall, build the wall. But what's the narrative the next time around? Is the narrative going to be lock all those socialists up because they're clearly anti-American, because they're clearly for the enemy? 
convict them all under the Espionage Act or convict them for treason if we're at war? Which, you know, if we go to war with Iran, for example, and many of us will speak up against that, many of us will say it is wrong. We absolutely should not be there. This is not what we should be doing. Are we then going to be called treasonous? Am I going to be called treasonous for spreading propaganda for the enemy because I'm speaking up saying we shouldn't be there? Am I going to be called, uh, am I going to be charged with, with treason for demoralizing the military, for saying, hey, look, this isn't the right thing to do? You're not going off and fighting a hero's fight? Who's going to be called a traitor? Who's going to be called a spy? I don't know. And I sure hope I don't have to find out. I sure hope that we don't end up going in that space. So um, thank you so much for supporting this channel, for watching this video. I know this was a long one. Um, and if you can support this channel through Patreon or through PayPal, I greatly appreciate it. Much of my content gets demonetized uh, because I do speak out so much about these types of topics. And I'm not sure if this one will, but there's always a huge chance of it. So I do appreciate your support. It really does help keep me afloat. I am a one person operation, which is why it also takes me a while to put out videos and I know I'm trying to get into a regular schedule I keep telling myself I'm going to and then everything ends up being so much more research and so much more work than I go into it thinking it's going to be when I started this topic I thought yeah I'll spend a couple of hours on it and then I'll be good um yeah 30 40 hours later <laughs> here we are so um again thank you so much for your support I really appreciate it and until next time hopefully tomorrow hopefully I'll see you guys tomorrow thanks